guide to using this aerial photo CD of Antietam National Battlefield. Each photo is presented twice. View 1 is the full-sized image with no interpretive text or graphics added. View 2 is identical to the first image but contains both interpretive text and added graphics. On the morning of September 17, 1862, Union General Joseph Hooker ordered his first corps to advance south along the Hagerstown Pike. Seeing General Thomas J. Jackson's Confederate forces occupying a cornfield, Hooker halted the advance and ordered his artillery to fire on the rebel position. Hooker's infantry came under fire from artillery which General Robert E. Lee had placed west of the Hagerstown Pike on Nicodemus Heights. When the morning phase of the battle intensified, Hooker's first corps was forced to pull back. General Joseph K.F. Mansfield's 12th Corps moved forward to attack Stonewall Jackson's Confederates. Mansfield was mortally wounded and General Adolphus S. Williams took command of the 12th Corps. As this was taking place, General John Sedgwick's division of General Edwin V. Sumner's 2nd Corps crossed Antietam Creek and marched in the direction of the East Woods. These events occurred over a period of more than three hours. Running east to west at the south end of the Miller Cornfield is Cornfield Avenue. This road roughly marks the initial deployment of Jackson's Confederate forces. During the morning phase of the battle, the Union and Confederate armies suffered a combined 12,600 casualties. That's roughly one soldier killed, wounded, or missing every two seconds. The majority of the losses occurred in the cornfield, which by some estimates changed hands 15 times. At approximately 9 a.m., General John Sedgwick's division of Sumner's 2nd Corps arrived on the field. Sumner then ordered Sedgwick's division into the West Woods. Seeing Sedgwick's approach, Jackson quickly paced his forces along with the newly arrived reinforcements under the cover of the West Woods. After Sedgwick's division crossed to Hagerstown Pike, the Confederates opened fire, causing 2,200 Union casualties in a little more than 20 minutes. Elements of Mansfield's 12th Corps advanced to the Dunkirk Church where intense fighting took place. A combination of artillery and infantry reinforcement enabled Jackson to drive the Union troops back towards the cornfield. The Dunker Church was severely damaged during the battle, but was rededicated in 1864 and remained in use until the turn of the century. The old church stood until 1921 when it was destroyed by a storm. In 1951, the Washington County Historical Society purchased the site and donated the property to the National Park Service. The reconstruction of the church was completed in 1961. During the battle, General George B. McClellan directed the movements of the Army of the Potomac from the home of Philip Pry. Afterwards, the Pry House was used as a field hospital for officers. In October, President Lincoln came here to visit General Israel B. Richardson, who was wounded during the fight at Bloody Lane. The Pry family never completely recovered from the damage done to their home and farm. 
and in 1874, they sold the property and moved away. The second phase of the battle took place at a country lane which, due to years of traffic from heavy farm wagons, resembled a large ditch. This sunken road made a perfect defensive position for General B.H. Hill's Confederate infantry. General William H. French's division of Sumner's 2nd Corps attacked the west end of the Rebel line. General Israel B. Richardson's division, also belonging to the 2nd Corps, attacked the east end of the line. Confederate General Robert Rhodes' official report best describes the fighting that took place at the sunken road. The enemy came to the crest of the hill overlooking my position and for five minutes bravely stood telling fire at about 80 yards, which my whole brigade delivered. Then they fell back a short distance, rallied, and were driven back again and again. Fearful of a Union breakthrough at the center of his line, Lee committed the last of his reserves and ordered General R.H. Anderson's division into the fight. The 2nd Brigade of the 1st Division of the 2nd Corps of the Army of Potomac was predominantly made up of Irish Americans. They were called the Irish Brigade and were commanded by General Thomas Francis Mayer. During the fight at the Sunken Road, they would advance to within 30 paces of the Rebel line, but lack of reinforcements and ammunition forced them to retire. The 61st and 64th New York Regiments of General John C. Caldwell's Brigade exploited an opening in the Confederate line and began firing down the length of the road. One Union soldier reported, We were shooting them like sheep in a pen. If a bullet missed the mark at first, it was able to strike the further bank, angle back, and take them secondarily. General Robert E. Rhodes ordered the 6th Alabama to execute a wheeling maneuver to meet the threat caused by Caldwell's breaching of the line. The order was misunderstood and the entire brigade moved off in the direction of the Piper Farm. Confederate Lieutenant Colonel E.P. Alexander later stated, When Rhodes' brigade left the sunken road, Lee's army was ruined and the end of the Confederacy was in sight. General James Longstreet used his artillery to slow the advance of the Union infantry in pursuit of the retreating rebels. D.H. Hill led about 200 men in a counterattack against the Union left flank. These actions had a stabilizing effect on the Confederate center. Lacking reinforcement, General Richardson was forced to order his men back to a position near the sunken road. After more than three hours of heroic sacrifice by both sides, the midday phase of the battle ended. The two opposing armies would suffer a combined 5,600 casualties at the sunken road. Forever after, the old roadbed would be known as Bloody Lane. General Roswell S. Ripley, fearing that the farmhouse would be used as cover for Union sharpshooters, ordered the Muma home burned. The third and final phase of the battle began southeast of Bloody Lane with an assault on Lee's right flank. McClellan entrusted this assignment to General Ambrose E. Burnside's IX Corps.
Burnside's infantry made repeated assaults on the Lower Stone Bridge in their effort to cross Antietam Creek. The attacks were repulsed by General Robert Toombs' 500 Georgians, who occupied the high ground on the west bank of the creek. Trees now line the nearly 50-foot high western bank of Antietam Creek, but at the time of the battle, General Toombs' brigade had a clear field of fire to cut down the exposed Union infantry. Burnside sent General Isaac P. Rodman's division south in search of another site to cross Antietam Creek. Rodman marched more than a mile before finding Snavely's Ford. After reaching the west side of the creek, Rodman moved upon the Confederate right and threatened Toombs' position. As noon approached, the Union forces were still being held on the east side of the Antietam Creek by Confederate fire. At around 1 p.m., the 51st Pennsylvania and the 51st New York regiments, under the command of General Edward Ferraro, mounted a spirited charge that succeeded in crossing the bridge. General Toombs was running low on ammunition and the Federal forces had crossed Antietam Creek at two separate locations. Toombs ordered his men to withdraw in the direction of Sharpsburg. Burnside paused at the bridge for two hours to rearm and reorganize before resuming his attack. At around 3 p.m., Burnside's corps began moving in the direction of Sharpsburg. The rebels formed a thin defensive line on the high ground in the area where Branch Avenue runs today. Robert E. Lee deployed artillery and whatever infantry he had left in an attempt to hold off the advance of the Union Ninth Corps. The Confederates began to give way and were forced to fall back in the direction of Sharpsburg by the steady advance of Burnside's 9th Corps Infantry. At around 4 p.m., Confederate General A.P. Hill's division arrives on the field by way of Miller Sawmill Road after a grueling march from Harper's Ferry, West Virginia. Following the Confederate victory at Harper's Ferry on the 15th, Stonewall Jackson ordered General A.P. Hill's Light Division to remain at Harper's Ferry and receive the Union surrender. On the 16th, Lee sent word for Hill to come to Sharpsburg at once, and the next day, Hill's division made the 17-mile march in just seven hours. Upon arriving and without hesitation, Hill ordered his men to attack the exposed Federal left flank. The surprise of Hill's attack destroyed the momentum of the Union advance and the Ninth Corps fell back to Antietam Creek. This final action effectively brought to an end the Battle of Antietam. Antietam National Cemetery was dedicated on September 17, 1867. The cemetery contains the remains of 4,776 American soldiers and their spouses. There are no Confederate dead buried at Antietam National Cemetery. The Battle of Antietam is the bloodiest single day of fighting that America has ever known, including both world wars. But incredibly, it ranks only seventh on the list of most costly American Civil War battles when multiple day engagements are included. Although Antietam National Battlefield Cemetery no longer permits new burials, an exception was made for Patrick Howard Roy, who was killed in the terrorist attack on the USS Cole on October 29, 2000.